Monster movies have been around for as long as the movie itself has, latching onto both ancient myths and new fears to tell scary stories of beasts beyond the natural world. In the early years, movies like the Universal Monsters and spectacles like King Kong showcased the dueling human fears and natural wonders possible in the monster movie. And in the years since, the subgenre has only continued to grow, encapsulating everything from comedies to action epics, making it hard to pin down just exactly what makes a monster movie a monster movie, besides the, you know, monster at the center. Monster movies can be everything from grounded human dramas to sci-fi adventures to body horror shockers. But with so many films contained in the subgenre, it's easy for some of the best to be overlooked. And if you're a fan of the channel, you know I love my monster movies. And with the Halloween season upon us, there's so much fun to be had no matter where you are. But if you're out at a haunted house, watching a movie, or trick-or-treating, the last thing you want is an old bulky wallet sticking out of your costume, or just making a mess when you're out celebrating. Just look at my old wallet. This thing was a mess, and it was time for a change. With Exter, I have a new, sleek, easy to use wallet. I love the Parliament wallet, that's half the size of a conventional wallet, but carries more than 12 cards and cash, all accessible at the click of a button. And the aluminum card holder that blocks RFID for extra security. When combined with Exter's solar powered tracking device, I can rest assured that my cards and money are always safe. And that's why I partnered with Exter to give you an exclusive discount. Enjoy up to 25% off using my code MD or by clicking the link in the description and pinned comment below. Like my video on 13 unsung slashers, these movies aren't ranked, but instead are listed chronologically for a trip through the lesser seen side of horror history. From giant animals to humans twisted by demons to creatures beyond our understanding, the monster movie is one of the most flexible of any horror story. So let's highlight 13 unsung monster movies that any fan of the genre should watch. Number 1. Werewolf of London from 1935 Written by John Colton and directed by Stuart Walker Our earliest entry at nearly 90 years old, Werewolf of London is the first ever werewolf feature film and, as such, contains both the archetypes that would come to define hundreds of movies, including the crystallization of the myth in The Wolfman, and some interesting contradictions. Here it's botanist Wilfred Glendon who is attacked by a werewolf while searching for a rare flower in Tibet, returning to London with his plant unaware that he brings the lycanthrope curse with him, endangering his wife and anyone close by across four nights of the full moon, while another werewolf, the one who bit him, tries to cure his own lycanthropy. With our lead a man of science trying to control his transformations, Werewolf of London has more in common with Frankenstein or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde instead of the mythical curse that would define Lon Chaney Jr.'s stories. As for our werewolf, actor Henry Hull was turned into the monster by Jack Pierce, the makeup artist responsible for so many of Universal's most iconic creatures. However, the combative Pierce butted heads with Hull, who wanted less extensive makeup for his werewolf look. The result is that Pierce's original, more fully animalistic design would eventually be used in The Wolfman, while Werewolf of London employs a slick, angry, drawn visage, obscured by cloaks while stalking a new female victim to satiate lust-filled violence. This is a monster that's more Jack the Ripper than Wolfman, a creature defined by base urges over science and reason. Number 2, Gorgo from 1961, written by John Loring and Daniel Hyatt and directed by Eugene Luray. You know I had to get a kaiju movie in here, right? And Gorgo is one of the strangest of them all, being an American and British production that lifts Japan's kaiju iconography for a completely western film that's part Godzilla, part King Kong, as a crew of sailors discover and capture a sea monster they name Gorgo. But when they bring it back to London to make lots of money, they realize it's a baby, and its much, much, much bigger mom is on the way to pick up her kid. And while I wouldn't say Gorgo is a good movie, it's a really fun movie. With all the suitmation, miniatures, panicked civilians, and military action that comes from the genre, its first half is charming and sleepy, bearing all the technicolor hallmarks of British productions of the time. But its final act is an amazing climax of extended kaiju chaos, as Mama Ogre absolutely destroys all of London, tearing down every landmark in sight. Gorgo is bloodless but also ruthless, with 
thousands crushed under our monster's claws. Simultaneously shocking in how far it's willing to go, and silly thanks to the massive amount of low-grade green screen and compositing. For anyone that enjoys the Showa era of Gojira and Gamera, Gorgo is a must-watch. Number 3, Alligator from 1980. Written by John Sayles and Frank Ray Pirelli and directed by Louis Teague. In the wake of the massive blockbuster success of Jaws, studios and creators were chomping at the bit to get a piece of giant animal money for themselves, and the sub-sub-genre of Jaws copycats has continued to some degree to this day. Alligator has all the hallmarks of a Jaws copycat when looked at on paper. A supersized real-life animal, disruption of a city's economy that the local government tries to ignore, and the combination of a weary cop, a scientist with expertise, and a hunter all chasing after the titular monster. But Alligator provides all those expected creature feature thrills with way more character business and tangents about Chicago than you'd ever expect. It's also much more low-key than you might think a picture about a giant hormone-powered sewer dwelling man-eating gator would be. But when our giant toothy fiend attacks, it results in all sorts of wonderfully horrifying carnage, playing up those old myths of gators flush into the sewers and mixing them with the spectacle we'd come to love decades later in Resident Evil 2's Gator. And of course, Robert Forster as our lead detective, navigating past trauma in the field and a messy love life, brings this thing up a few notches because the man never phoned in a performance in his life. Altogether, Alligator is a pretty great time, not just because of the monster mayhem. This gator seems especially intent on ending the patriarchy, but because of the fun and textured characters. Number 4, Q the Winged Serpent from 1982, written and directed by Larry Cohen. Come for the stop-motion Quetzalcoatl, stay for the murderer's row of character actors and 80s New York griminess. Larry Cohen is a fascinating figure in the history of horror and genre-heavy small films, creating movies that have high concepts but focus more on offbeat characters and their struggles. In Q, an ancient flying monster is unleashed on New York City, but the movie itself is way more interested in the life of small-time crook and wannabe jazz player Jimmy, played by Michael Moriarty the type of character who would typically stay a supporting piece in most movies like this. And with David Carradine, Richard Roundtree, and Candy Clark filling out the detective and romantic sides of the story, your eyes are glued to the colorful characters instead of the monster. There's this fascinating sense of realism to everything here, using real New York locations, including the actual inside of the Chrysler Building's crown. It looks like a kitchen sink drama from the 70s, plays like an offbeat comedy, and has the larger narrative beats of something like King Kong. And while our stop-motion kaiju has plenty of moments causing mayhem and raining down blood across the Big Apple, it's the characters who are in focus, with Moriarty giving a fascinating Cassavetes-esque lived-in performance as the monster feels more like New York's biggest pest problem instead of a world-shaking arrival. It's just a really great chill trip into New York's past, with a little cult sacrifice and bitten-off heads being thrown in for good measure. Number 5, The Deadly Spawn from 1983. Written and directed by Douglas McKeown, by far the cheapest and scrappiest film on this list. The Deadly Spawn was made for only $25,000, and it's the blend of DIY ingenuity meets total inexperience in front of and behind the camera that makes it special. Set almost entirely in one house, the film tracks a comet that lands nearby and unleashes a horde of toothy, hungry, constantly multiplying alien worms that take up residence in the basement. Essentially, every shot and performance makes the lack of budget abundantly clear, but that only makes the wild kills and ruthless, constantly evolving story all the more exciting. The script isn't anything to write home about, but I love that while it's our four teens that are at the center of the story, it's the horror-loving younger brother who has it all figured out, with his love of monster movies preparing him for battle with a dangerous alien. And with McKeown happy to put all his carnage on full display, budget be damned, the result is a gleeful mix of gross-out deaths that look both fake and impressive. I'd equate the deadly spawn most closely with The Evil Dead, a passion project with its shoestring showing, but fearless in its ambitions. One of my favorite things to do while watching an effects-heavy horror movie is to spot and figure out each type of effect used to bring the horror to life. And with the deadly spawn using mechanical puppets, miniatures, mannequins, blood packs, and wire puppetry, it's a blast to watch unfold. 
Number 6, Razorback from 1984, written by Everett DeRoche and directed by Russell Mulcahy. The second of our Jaws-inspired giant animal horrors, Razorback is an Australian production that fully leverages the beauty and terror of the outback for this story of an enormous wild boar rampaging across the countryside. With an end of Act 1 character twist, Razorback has just enough changes to its story to not be a completely obvious giant animal horror. But the hallmarks are here, with ruthless outback hunters being the major villains alongside our enormous Razorback. The big pig itself is an animatronic, almost always obscured even in broad daylight. But Mulcahy and crew are able to convey its size and danger with shaking, thunderous camera work, great sound design, and the general idea of being eaten alive. The opening minutes are the film's most haunting and scary. What I really like is Mulcahy's almost surreal direction in this Ozploitation thriller, with cinematographer Dean Semler of Road Warrior fame highlighting the dry, dusty, dangerous, but still beautiful nature of the country's wilderness, alongside some truly scummy human killers. It's a little bit Jaws, a little bit Wake and Fright, and balances its leads between fish-out-of-water Americans and tough-as-nails Australians, as the outback turns everyone into tough survivalists. Number 7, Night of the Creeps from 1986, written and directed by Fred Decker. As a whole, zombie movies don't exactly fall into the monster movie subgenre, as they've become so popular and created so many of their own tropes as to be their own thing. However, I think that Fred Decker's Night of the Creeps has so many different elements going on that it can be seen as both a zombie movie and a sci-fi monster movie, with its story of alien worms unleashed and turning infected humans into walking incubator husks that multiply and consume. With its alien opening transitioning into 50s black and white monster throwback into 80s horror mystery, it feels like a little bit of everything you could want from a monster movie. Night of the Creeps is an incredibly fun time, fully embracing a throwback B-movie style without winking at the camera. It's basically a sampler platter of sci-fi, slasher, zombie, and mystery genres all pulled together into a college comedy about getting the girl and getting one over on the jocks. I really enjoy the chemistry of its leads and the ruthlessness of its head-bursting worms, leading to lots of shocking reveals as Decker sets up the next wild plot point, promises to pay it off, and then delivers. A giant bomb on its initial release, it's a true cult classic that has never really transcended into more mainstream acceptance. But I'm here for all these squishy deaths, flamethrowers, and melodramatic pathos. Also, Tom Atkins and Dick Miller are here, two MVPs of low-budget horror. This movie is undeniable. I got good news and bad news, girls. The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. Number 8, Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight from 1995. Written by Mark Bishop, Ethan Reef, and Cyrus Forrest, and directed by Ernest Dickerson. Are demon movies considered to be monster movies? Not to split hairs, but once the horrors of possession and exorcism take the spotlight, I think they become their own subgenre. Here, a single location Survive the Night type story uses demons and the war between heaven and hell to tell a wild tale about a small band of survivors trying to hold the line against a growing tide of monsters and Billy Zane. The first spin-off of the classic Tales from the Crypt TV show, Demon Knight doesn't really need the Crypt branding beyond the little extra dash of fun that the Crypt Keeper brings at the beginning and end. You don't even really need to know anything about Tales to enjoy this movie that's very much in the vein of a Sam Raimi spookablast, getting very close to Evil Dead 2 at times, which of course is a positive, as Evil Dead 2 is the greatest movie of all time, just above Predator, Kiki's Delivery Service, Chunking Express, and Before Sunset. And while the fates that befall many of our characters and the looming threats of deals with the devil make this a horror movie, it's very much thrills and twists first, horror second. Of course, all those twisted creatures make this a fantastic monster movie, where your very soul and flesh are in danger of becoming the monster. But it's the combo of Zane at his most Billy Zane as a super charismatic villain, William Sadler as the mysterious fugitive, and Jada Pinkett Smith as our new hero that make it more than just an effects fest brought to life with absolutely energetic direction by Dickerson. Plus, Dick Miller is here. Number 9, The Relic from 1997. Written by Amy Holden Jones, John Raffo, Rick Jaffa, and Amanda Silver, and directed by Peter Hyams. 
based on the novel Relic by Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. The film version of this museum set monster mayhem is a much more simplified story of native myths colliding with modern science. The movie is split about 50-50 between slow discovery of the monster lurking beneath the museum and mayhem followed by the fight to survive. Monster movies always exist somewhere along the spectrum between pure myth and pure science. Here, the relic is right in between, dropping a mythic beast into a scientific realm that slowly comes to understand its scientific basis. It's a fun monster mystery made in the mini monster resurgence of the late 90s that not only features my ninth favorite thing, natural history museums, but also my third favorite thing sneaking around natural history museums at night. The creature designed by the GOAT, Stan Winston, is very original and fun, and Tom Sizemore and Penelope Ann Miller are good co-leads. But the final act is a mess due to terrible editing, lighting, and pacing. And when you look at pictures of Winston's Kothoga monster, it really makes an impression for how strange and scary it is. But it's shot in such a way as to be barely readable on screen. The relic may have its flaws, but it's the rare case of a modern, big-budget monster movie that isn't hiding its genre. Number 10, Mimic, also from 1997. Written by Matthew Robbins and Guillermo del Toro, and directed by Guillermo del Toro. Del Toro's second feature film and his first for a Hollywood studio, the creator described making the movie as a horrible, horrible, horrible experience, due to the consistent interference and abuse by <sighs> Harvey Weinstein who tried to fire Del Toro during the shoot and took away Final Cut privilege. The result is a compromised movie that Del Toro never loved. But years later, the chance to do a director's cut healed his wounds by restoring at least some of his vision. Director's cut or not, Mimic is a super creepy and aesthetically effective monster movie, with mutated cockroaches growing to human sizes under New York, and only a small group of scientists and cops led by Mira Sorvino and a scene-stealing Charles S. Dutton able to stop them. Del Toro said, I have a sort of fetish for insects, clockwork, monsters, dark places, and unborn things. And all of those elements are in place in Mimic. As the film descends into slimy, dark underground tunnels, after a more academic first act, the best things about the film are Dan Lauston's inky cinematography, Del Toro's disgusting designs, the haunting music by Marco Beltrami, and some unexpectedly brutal deaths that refuse to spare anyone a fate of being eaten alive by humongous bugs. Number 11, Deep Rising from 1998, written and directed by Stephen Summers. Just a year before making The Mummy, Stephen Summers made an action horror movie with very similar sensibilities regarding cheesy action, gross out deaths, and a fine line between camp and machismo. Here, it's a crew of mercenaries and the boat they've hired, led by the late great Treat Williams, that intercepts a massive cruise liner where a shifty thief played by Famke Janssen is the only one to survive the arrival of a massive, man-eater, deep-sea worm monster that likes to dissolve and drink its victims alive. Deep Rising knows that it's here to give its audiences a fun, constantly exploding good time, with a little bit of the alien's DNA in its structure of heavy-loaded mercenaries meeting a monster they can't prepare for. Its action, where endless rounds are fired from machine guns that never need to reload, reminds me of old-school arcade shooters like Terminator 2, where the only objective is to unload on everything in front of you. And yes, the comedy is cheesy and the one-liners are silly, but Deep Rising legitimately rips in a way only a 90s monster movie can. And some of these deaths, boy, they give me nightmares if I wasn't laughing and cheering at each new person that was gruesomely dissolved. My only gripe is that the ending jet ski chase is so good that the entire movie should have taken place on jet skis. Number 12, Dog Soldiers from 2002, written and directed by Neil Marshall. Part military action, part survival horror, all werewolf movie. Dog Soldiers sets itself apart from the typical lupine terror by making its monsters into pure villains without any real tragedy to their situation. Instead, we're with a British squad on a training exercise that stumbles into the hunting grounds of a pack, soon forcing them to hole up in a cabin and fight for their lives against some absolutely vicious and truly massive werewolves that can't be put down by the hundreds of rounds they have at their disposal. The small budget is covered up by its pitch black setting that screams early 2000s horror. 
With A Little Evil Dead, Night of the Living Dead, and Aliens DNA, Marshall is cribbing from the best for a siege story where every death makes you wince, because you've actually come to really like these characters due to the believable, established friendships they have with one another. Dog Soldiers is able to constantly switch back and forth between spooky and thrilling, thanks to its strong tonal control. A kinda rubbish twist near the end is offset by Sean Pertwee, Kevin McKidd, and company being absolute badasses who only get tougher as the night wears on. And number 13, The Void from 2016. Written and directed by Steven Kostansky and Jeremy Gillespie, a micro-budget horror whose effects were paid for by a Kickstarter campaign, The Void is strongly echoing H.P. Lovecraft's brand of cosmic horror and humans twisted by powers beyond comprehension. But it's also clearly influenced by John Carpenter, with a lot of The Thing, Prince of Darkness, and Halloween 2 in the DNA here. Translating the Lovecraftian unknown to film is always a challenge, because capturing something on film makes it known. But I I like how The Void keeps things mysterious, while still giving its monsters plenty of screen time. The Void story is pretty simple. Honestly, it's a little too simple for all the cosmic terror it implies. With a small group of people holed up in a hospital besieged by cultists and slowly overtaken by all sorts of crazy monsters. And while there's a through line of parental grief and how people cope in the aftermath of the loss of a child, the real selling point here are those creature effects, as normal people are twisted into unrecognizable shapes. Lovecraftian horror can qualify as sci-fi or fantasy, but the wild effects here push it fully into the monster category, with a little extra neon portal visuals for good measure. All portals should be neon. And with that, we reach the end of this journey through the unsung mashes of monsters. And I hope this inspired you to dive deeper into the lesser seen side of creatures, critters, and the strangest figures in horror. Thanks for watching today's video, and Halloween season is officially here. This is the first of many videos this Halloween, and I wanted to kick things off by going back to a new series of videos that I started a little earlier this year. As I mentioned in the video, I've previously done a video on 13 unsung slashers, and I had so much fun doing that video, and people seemed to enjoy it so much, that I decided to continue doing that with other subgenres of horror. And obviously, I'm a big fan of monster movies in general, as I've done a lot of kaiju movies and just monster movies covered in the channel over the years, and so I thought this would be the next great one to cover. Obviously, monster movies are super flexible, so there are so many that could qualify for this subgenre. So I'm sure there are a lot that I could have covered here that did not make the list. With some smaller gems that were a little too well known like Arachnophobia and Ravenous deserving their own dedicated videos, and there not being enough space for other honorable mentions like them, Tammy and the T-Rex, Black Sheep, The Nest, Rawhead Rex, The Stuff, Leviathan, and Orca. In any case, I hope this inspired you to check out some more monster movies that you maybe hadn't heard of before, or going back to ones that you haven't seen in a while. I'd love to hear what some of your favorite unsung monster movies are in the comments. And if this inspired you to check out some of these movies, please let me know after you've watched them. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these strange, lesser talked about movies in this wonderful subgenre. And of course, a big thank you to Extra Wallets for sponsoring this video. And for an extra discount for yourself, make sure to check out the promo code and link in the description and comments below. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support. And if you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only reviews, as I continue lots and lots of horror coverage for the Halloween season on Patreon as well. So until next time, which will be very soon as we blow it out for Halloween, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and watching some awesome monster movies. Happy Halloween!